Hey, good morning, everyone. Hope you're having a great weekend. So the events of the past couple of weeks with the mass shootings in Buffalo and Texas have undoubtedly got us thinking about, you know, good and evil and how we can stop such evil from occurring again and again and again. And um, and honestly, I, I wish I could provide some answers, but I, I can't no more than anybody else can. But it did get me thinking about a parable that Jesus told, the parable of the wheat and the weeds, or the wheat and the tares, as some of you might have grown up hearing. Really, as you'll learn in the, the message, it's the parable of the wheat and the Darnell ryegrass. <laughs> so hopefully this parable and my interpretation of it will cause you to look at this problem from a fresh perspective. Before we get into the message, though, I wanted to say something about these YouTube videos. I started doing these videos when COVID shut churches down, and many churches started live streaming their services, but I, I reason that you know, after the live stream is over, it's just a video on the church website. And honestly, it's not a very good video. So I figured that it would be better to actually produce and edit a sermon video, which challenged me to write my sermons differently, to write them more creatively, but also forced me to learn some basic gra graphic design and editing skills and stuff like that. And, um, and many of you over the course of the last couple of years have become faithful viewers. And I'd love to have more of our people back at attending live services, but many, many of them aren't ready for that and perhaps never will be. But many of my regular reviewers were never a part of FBC Frederick and don't know anyone who goes there except me. Uh, a lot of you don't even live in Frederick or even in Maryland, but you're faithful in watching these videos. And I'm, I'm incredibly thankful for that and I'm humbled by it as well. So in, in a sense, this YouTube platform has given our church uh, a third service, you know, two that are live each Sunday morning, and a third that is all of you. So moving forward, I'm going to be doing some things differently that hopefully will make this more effective. Mainly that involves interacting with all of you. So please, after, after each message, leave a comment or a question, and I promise to read each one and respond. I'll answer any questions you have or enter into dialogue with you, you know, if you have something that you you know disagree with something that I said, be courteous. I mean, remember that others will be reading your comments, but that also means that others will benefit by the dialogue even if they never join in. We'd also like to get these video messages out to more people, and there are some simple things that you can do that'll make the YouTube algorithm promote these videos more on the platform. Now, obviously, you can share the video with others by clicking the share button, but there are a couple of other things that you can do, you know, like and subscribe like every YouTube creator says, but that actually makes a, a huge difference. Comments not only help us create community, but YouTube notices videos that have a lot of interaction. So once again, please comment. Let's, let's talk. And one thing that YouTube really pays attention to is how long a person sticks with the video. If most people click off after five minutes, YouTube doesn't promote that video. But if a large percent of people who click the video stay to the very in, uh, YouTube is more likely to promote that video. So even if I bore you in the first five minutes or so, you know, leave the video running and go make a sandwich or something. I mean, seriously, it'll make a difference. So thanks again. I appreciate all of you for watching these messages. Now let's get into today's message. Last week, the Associated Press, Washington Post, and numerous other news outlets reported that a 65-year-old pastor in Warsaw, Indiana, ended the worship service by announcing his immediate resignation and confessing to adultery. He said the affair had started 20 years before and had lasted, in his words, far too long. I committed adultery, he said. I need to say that, and you deserve to hear it. The congregation responded with a standing ovation, but they grew silent when a woman in her 40s went to the lectern and addressed the pastor. It was 27 years ago, not 20, she said. I was just 16 when you took my virginity on your office floor. Do you remember that? I know you do. I was a prisoner and you kept me in your prison, she said. I'm a prisoner no longer. When members of the congregation asked the pastor if it was true, he admitted that it was. Everyone was stunned. 
Then some members formed a circle around the pastor as a man prayed for him. But one man in the congregation said, I can't watch this, and presumably left. Others left with him. We think we know what an authentic Christian looks like, which means we also know what a counterfeit Christian looks like. But we don't, do we? I don't know this, Pastor, but when the church leadership put out a statement after that Sunday service, it described him and his wife as having both led and modeled a Christ-driven message of repentance, forgiveness, and restoration. Are they lying? Probably not. I'm sure to all appearances, he looked like the kind of Christian many people strive to become, but he wasn't. It's undoubtedly too harsh to call him a fake Christian, but part of his walk was fake. Part of it was sincere and authentic, which made the fake part even harder to spot. We can often see through an obviously fake person. Unless a person's a sociopath, nobody's that good of an actor. Sincerity hides inauthenticity well because it's so, well, sincere. Of course, this story comes on the heels of a 300-page report issued last Sunday that Southern Baptist leadership had ignored, nullified, and often vilified sex abuse survivors when they came forward with accusations against their clergy abusers. Now, mind you, the report focuses on Southern Baptist leadership's response to reports of abuse. It doesn't directly address the number of alleged sexual abuse cases against pastors and staff members. But from other sources, you can gather that it's extensive and, I might add, predictable. I mean, rape and pedophilia are products of a power imbalance. The victims are smaller and weaker than their abusers, and the, the abusers are almost always in some position of power over their victims. Southern Baptists insist on a male-only clergy, particularly for senior pastor and executive pastor positions. And men are, in general, physically bigger and stronger than women, and of course, children. And Southern Baptists also imbue a great deal of authority to those positions. They're, they're the head of a patriarchal hierarchy. And then there's the spiritual authority most church members assign to their senior pastors and to their youth ministers. So when you combine a man's physical power with positional authority, the danger of abuse is ramped up. When you combine both of those elements with the spiritual authority of God's calling and imprimatur, well, abuse is, if not inevitable, at least predictable. This is among the many reasons why I personally no longer identify myself as Southern Baptist and why many in our church don't either. And it's why I believe that women pastors are not only good and healthy for Christianity, but necessary. But back to my point, each of these abusers were looked upon not only by their victims, but by their churches as examples of a good Christian, a model to follow and to emulate, which for some make the allegations of abuse hard to believe and then leads the women and children who come forward subject to, what does the report say? Being ignored, nullified, and vilified. Because we think we can tell a good Christian from a bad Christian, an authentic Christian, from an inauthentic Christian. And we can't. I mean, we're terrible at it. We're terrible at distinguishing between the righteous and the unrighteous. We being all people, not just Christians, everyone is. Religious people may be the worst of all, though, but everyone is pretty bad at it. We don't think we're as bad at it as we are, but we are. And the thing is, Jesus tried to tell us that we're bad at it and that we shouldn't do it. In Matthew 13, Jesus told his disciples a parable. Let's take a look at it, beginning with verse 24. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? 
But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. This is one of those parables where the meaning's pretty straightforward. Now, that's not always the case because Jesus didn't tell these parables to us. He told them to Middle Eastern Hebrews living in the first century, and he assumes a lot of information understood by them, but it's not accessible to 21st century Americans. But this one's pretty clear, at least on the surface. The only cultural thing that you need to know is that the weed that has been sown among the wheat is Lolium temilentum, or Darnell ryegrass, an annoying weed that looks very much like wheat, especially before it matures. And it can carry a poisonous fungus. If it's harvested and ground together with the wheat, the, the resulting flour is spoiled. As late as a week before the wheat, the difference between the broadest Darnell leaf and the narrowest wheat leaf is just one millimeter or 0 0.039 inches. Even a botanist would have a hard time distinguishing the two, much less a peasant harvester in the first century. But at the time of harvest, the difference has grown to between 6 and 12 millimeters or a quarter to a half inch. Anybody can see that difference. But for most of their growing period, you can't tell the difference between the ryegrass and the wheat. You can't see the difference. And that's the plain meaning of Jesus' teaching. The ability to tell the difference between the righteous and the unrighteous, between those who love Jesus with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength, and those who, who don't, or those who are making an earnest effort at it but fall short, versus those who really are trying but know how to put on appearances. That, that ability escapes most of us. And by most of us, I mean all of us. I mean, we're just really, really bad at it. See, this is the original sin. And by original sin, I don't mean the sin that Adam did that subsequently infected all of us. I mean original in that we all do it because we're all Adams, which in Hebrew just simply means human. This is what we do. So if you look at the original sin, it breaks down into three parts. First is the desire to decide for ourselves what is right and what is wrong. That's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If that's where it ended, it would be trouble enough, but that's not where it ends. We want everyone else to conform to our understanding of what is right and what is wrong. We want to decide right and wrong and then impose that on the rest of the world. Religious people are among the worst at doing this. We, we pick and choose the parts of the Bible that conform to what we feel is right and wrong and then try to create the world in that image and likeness. And anybody who doesn't conform is unrighteous. They literally aren't right. They're wrong. They're wrong people. And that's the next phase of original sin, wanting to decide for ourselves and for everyone else who is right and who is wrong. That's the blame game that Adam and Eve tried to play with God in Eden. The woman you gave me told me to eat, and so I ate. Or the serpent you created tricked me. They blame someone, anyone, other than take responsibility for themselves. And ultimately, they, they blame God for the mess that they created. But ultimately, the story of Adam and Eve isn't the story of two people, one named Adam and one named Eve. It's the story of all of us, whatever our names happen to be. This is what we do. We're all convinced that we are wheat and we think we know who the weeds are. It's, it's clear, isn't it? The pastor who loves his flock and seeks to guide it faithfully, being true to the Bible and to Jesus' message of reconciliation? Wheat. The pastor who takes the virginity of a 16-year-old girl, no doubt convincing her that he genuinely cares for her and isn't just using her to deal with his own inner demons? A weed. Except in this instance... It's the same person. And if it sounds like I'm excusing the abuser, I'm not, not at all. But I am warning you that he's not all that different than you or me. See, the line between good and evil doesn't run between those people who are wheat and those people who are weeds. The line between good and evil runs through each of us. Each of us is capable of great good and each of us is capable of great evil. And often the only thing that keeps us from sliding into evil is power 
and opportunity, the means to do it, and the circumstances that allow us to think that we can get away with it. And that's the third part of original sin, embodied in the story of Cain and Abel. Cain, having decided that he had been wronged when God rejected his sacrifice, but then accepted Abel's, found himself with both the power to kill Abel and the opportunity. I mean, they're out in the field, no one around, no witnesses, and he can make it look like, you know, Abel fell and hit his head on a rock rather than the other way around. And so he murdered his brother. They they shared the same parents, had the same upbringing. They, they shared the same DNA. They were genetically as similar as you can get without being the same person. The only difference was power, opportunity, and the arrogance of thinking that that he could tell the difference between who is right and who is wrong and who deserves to live and who deserves to die. And if you don't think you do the same thing, well, let's do a little mental exercise. In the story of Cain and Abel, who's wheat and who's weed? Cain is clearly a weed and Abel is clearly wheat, right? And see, in, in spite of what Jesus has told us in this parable, we all still think that we can tell the difference between, you know, triticum estivium and lolium temiluntum, bearded spring wheat and darnel ryegrass. Or take the temple leadership, the high priest and the Sanhedrin, the guys who crucified Jesus. They're the bad guys in this story, right? But... Look at things from their perspective. They're trying to navigate their way peacefully through the powder keg that is Roman-occupied Judea in the first century. They've got violent revolutionaries like Barabbas trying to convince the peasant population to rise up in armed rebellion against Rome. They've got the Pharisees, a bunch of self-righteous lay people who obey parts of the Torah that really only apply to the priest. And then they're running around condemning everyone else for not doing the same thing as them. And, and, and then there's Rome just looking for an excuse to burn the whole place down and get rid of all the religious zealots. And then along comes this guy from Nazareth in Galilee that all the peasants just love. And he comes to Jerusalem, overturning tables and predicting the destruction of the sacred temple and, and calling the Lord my father, which is as close to blasphemy as you can get without calling yourself God. So they're in quite the pickle. And in Jesus, they've clearly identified a weed in their midst. And they've, they've decided to pluck him out of the ground and let him die. And, and in doing so, they committed a great evil. They killed an innocent person who ended up actually being the son of God. And so in doing so, they became the very evil they were trying to destroy. If you look closely at this parable, this is really what Jesus is warning us about. Sometimes evil and the people who do it really are easy to identify. I mean, a pastor who rapes a 16-year-old girl, a white supremacist who goes into a supermarket and murders random African-Americans because of some whacked out replacement theory of white genocide, or a mentally deranged 18-year-old who purchases assault weapons as soon as he's legally able and shoots up elementary school children. Easy to identify, right? I mean, clearly so. Rape is evil. White supremacy is evil. Murder is evil. If you look closely at the parable, the slaves know enough to be able to identify that someone has sown some Darnell ryegrass among the wheat. So, so this, it's obviously far enough along that they can tell the difference. The householder knows that when ryegrass grows among the wheat, he knows that what happens is that their roots actually get entangled with each other. So that even if you can tell the difference, you can't pull up a weed without also pulling up some wheat. The takeaway for us seems pretty straightforward. Even, even if we weren't so bad at telling the righteous from the unrighteous, even if the line between good and evil didn't run through each of us, but between us, even if it's absolutely clear who the evildoers are, when we take it upon ourselves to root them out, 
we often do more damage than good. I mean, this is something that requires surgical precision, but instead of a scalpel, we bring a blunt ax to the operating room. And in taking out the bad guys, we end up taking out some of the good guys. And that's not collateral damage, that's murder. It does no good to root out evil. If in the process, you have to commit even more evil. In the end, good loses and evil wins. Evil wins when evil people commit evil acts, but it wins even more when it can get good people to commit evil. It's for this reason that Jesus told us not to resist an evildoer, because we are more prone to commit evil to stop evil, and evil still wins. Jesus asks us to do something even harder than that. He asks us, no, he, he commands us to love our enemies, to pray for them. It may not stop our enemies from committing evil, but it'll stop us from committing it. Loving our enemies may not change our enemies, but it'll change us. And ultimately, that's the only lasting change you can affect. <laughs> one, of the, one of the first lessons any married couple has to learn, and it's the hardest lesson to learn, and many don't learn it, is that you can't change the other person. You can only change yourself. It's not your job to judge other people. It's God's. It's not your job to point out the sins in other people. It's God's. Your job is to love. To love God and to love others, all others. That guy who shot up all those people in Buffalo, he didn't do it because he had been loved too much. Hate doesn't grow in a person because they've been loved too much, but because they've been loved too little. Often in the face of great evil, we feel helpless, but we aren't. We just have to trust Jesus enough to love like he told us to, to trust him enough to have mercy. Often in the face of great evil, we feel helpless but we really aren't. We, we just have to trust Jesus enough to love like he told us to love, to trust him enough to actually obey him. Father, we are not to be of this world system, but to be of that of your kingdom. I pray that we will not be conformed into the pattern of this world and squeezed into its mold, but day by day, be increasingly transformed into the image and likeness of our Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to take every thought captive and to surrender our hearts and lives to you in true obedience and in godly humility. May all of your children be drawn closer to each other and to you as you do a good work in each of our lives. Build us up into a spiritual house with Christ as the cornerstone. And may your indwelling Holy Spirit prompt and guide us, encourage and train us. Lord, we surrender all to you today that we may walk in newness of love and humble obedience all the days of our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.